the, two, the two things that I like most about my life, I think, are that um, I waited for quite a while between marriages to, um, took 20 years actually to, um, to be able to say to myself, no, this is not, this woman that I'm involved with is not the right fit for me, and to do very gentle exits until I found a woman who, even though she was very different from me and I never would have picked her out of Match.com, uh, we had a connection and a way of hanging out together that really felt very comfortable for, for both of us, I think. And, um, and, so, um, and that's, so that's become one of the happiest parts of my life now, is choosing to make sure I didn't um, impregnate anyone or alienate anyone or get into um, a, 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 a mix of um, bad blood that left me um, residually feeling negative. Uh, toward women or toward myself or having myself attacked. And so um, that, that has allowed me to now have a life with a woman I really um, you know, love. And so one of the great challenges in my life now is like in coming here for this weekend was, you know, really wanting to get in a plane and get back to my wife. And the other hand, this the great joy of the weekend. And so, um, but when you have that type of desire to be with somebody, it's, um, and, and that really adds a great deal of everyday joy to your, to your life or to my life at least. Um, and then I think the other um, thing that I'm very happy about is that, I've, um, that I did choose early in my life to do uh, what I felt was following my bliss. Um, but um, I've always had the discipline to, I, I always say when you follow your bliss, it's the money you'll miss. Uh, because almost all fulfilling occupations um, pay very little because lots of people want to do them. And, um, and so there's a huge supply with, in relation to the demand, so the money, the pay can go down. And so I knew that early in my life, and, um, and then I, uh, and I got involved with something that was, very, um, that was very blissful for me, which was you know, deeply into gender issues and um, a leader in the feminist movement, sort of the, you know, a leading male feminist, if you will. And, um, and then I started to see things happen that were not in, in integrity for me. And so I started to, and when I started speaking up about them, I lost a, about 85, 90% of my income. And so um, I started to ask myself the question, do I really want to, um, should I just compromise a little bit and keep my income, you know, or should I say what I really want to say and and do it for as long as I can possibly get away with doing it? <laughs> and um, and I decided to at least try the um, you know the uncompromising course of you know being tactful and diplomatic, but also at the same time saying what I felt was the best version of the truth that I could arrive at. And so uh, and I've really been very happy that I've done that. So having. Uh, and so I'm 70 now, and so I feel very energized to still write and to still talk and to still think. And the things that I was, was writing about 20 and 30 years ago are beginning to bear fruit now in places like Australia, not because of me, but you know, because of the way people have evolved. And, um, and so it's really very heartening to see um, the, the things that I've been talking about for 20 or 30 years begin to become part of the discussions of, of uh, people's everyday life and uh, for things to move in that direction and particularly father involvement and particularly the concerns I had with uh, new purposes for boys um, rather than the purpose of disposability, things like that are becoming part of the of discussions now. And so that's very rewarding and making me very happy about that part of my life. What's challenging for me today is, um, ironically, that that I you know that I love spending, for example, my weekends with my wife, but I also love writing, <laughs> and so um, you know, sort of how to do, and I and I so so some part of me knows that if I. Um, if I spend um, the weekend with my wife, wife, I won't produce as much. And, and if I, on the other hand, if I produce, um, you know, I realize that I'm going to die uh, sooner or later, and the the world's going to live on without me. Pretty much, um, you know, six of one, half a dozen of the other. And so, you know, why spend all these weekends um, efforting myself to do something that, you know, that is not making me as as happy, or is it making me as happy? So that's a real challenge. The other um, uh, part is I feel like um, in my personal life I sort of 
I grew up with, you know, very connected to the feminist community, very connected to the academic academic community while I got my PhD. Um, the uh, very connected to um, uh, things like uh, ABC, which is in our country is uh, PBS or NPR, uh, National Public Radio. That that liberal perspective on the world is me, and all the people who are aligned with me in most areas, um, the uh, the people on NPR producer. The, the people who are politically liberal in the White House, the people who are, um, uh, are, are uh, in the academic community, those are all people who, are, uh, who, have, who believe that I am the enemy because I am saying that men, um, men need to be paid attention to and, and men's issues are important and, um, and that they're part of the same, um, <laughs> the same process as, um, the, uh, as women's issues. And we, we're all working, we need to all work together, not, not as, a, as, a, as oppressors and oppressed. Mm -hmm. And so that perspective is still not... Um, not experienced as being true or even being worth considering um, in the communities of people that I have the most um, the most natural connection with and so that is um, uh, sad for me because you, know, uh, you know all my original friends for that I built for 15 or 20 years they they you know 90 percent of them consider me part of the enemy um, and so that's very uh, that's very sad I always have a, um, tears that come to my eyes when I think of my dad, and as I think a lot of us do. And I can remember one of the things that I most respected about him is that he always made it clear to me uh, and uh, that he was like offered a better position at his, at his work. Um, but that would take him into a managerial position that would take him away from time with us. And that he was always balancing um, the acceptance or the rejection of those managerial positions uh, for the for for what it took away from or offered him in terms of time with the family, and yet at the same time he didn't um, you know he didn't do as much you know th playing ball and real um, sort of personal discussions and he was not open he was not a person who. Um, allowed for differences of opinions without becoming attacking. Um, and so in that respect, um, he taught me how the importance of listening um, by, by bad example. <laughs> and, um, and at the same time, you know, he, had, he was always interested in discussions, even though he had to dominate them. Um, he was interested in discussions that were thoughtful, and he brought that, and he read a lot, and he brought that to the table. And, um, and I remember when um, my family lived in, uh, one of the things that he did during his life was to manage a company in Holland, and, or the Netherlands. And uh, so the family went over to live in the Netherlands when I was 14 or 15 years of age. And then I worked as a, a cabin boy on the boats on the Seine River in Paris. And the combination of being in Paris as a 15-year-old boy and having um, guys come on to me, but um, but not women, <laughs> and um, and having to, you know, I, I had no idea, and you know, and guys would invite me up to their to their place to you know to talk and have tea, and I'd accept it, and then realize that they were beginning to come on to me, and I had to sort of deal with that, you know, and because um, I'm very heterosexually in, in or orientation, but I was too innocent at that time to even know what was really happening. And yet, at the same time, the French just treated that as part of life, and it was no big thing. And you know, and uh, that's what you know, that's what happened, and you learned to, to deal with it. And then um, uh, having to um, uh, to just to just be exposed to those um, to those to a different culture at that age was enormously um, gratifying and um, um, mind expanding to me. But um, so while I was enjoying that process, my mother. Uh, was moving into depression, and she was. Uh, she didn't like. She loved living in the St United States. She didn't like the rainy, the rainy days of you know of, of Holland, and the um, and the fact that she didn't have anyone that she naturally connected to, and she was going downhill. And so my mother would, you know, my mother would say to me, Warren, I'm really depressed and I'm really feeling down, and and then she and my father would talk that through, and he then. Um, he said to her, you know, move back with the family, with you and the children, move back. And I'll, cut, I'll finish my job here for the next, next few months. And so I went back to the United States and 
He walked around the streets selling floor brushes, which is just a door-to-door -door salesperson of, of brushes. And, um, and he did that for about a year and a half. Um, you know, and I always respected him more for that than for the positions he held because his willingness to support my mom and, and us to, to have her not be depressed was to be the greatest form of heroism uh, for, me, for me. I don't have any feelings about this, though. <laughs> my mother was very, um, she was strong, and she was very um, discipline-oriented, and um, neither she nor my father were as much fun-oriented as I would have liked, or, um, and, uh, and they were typically not um, easy, it was not easy to discuss your feelings with them. Um, and so um, those were the sad parts of that. Um, my, uh, my mother was quite protective, and so, um, but I was always, and so I was, um, I didn't have a quarterback's personality. Um, you know, I could, um, I could, I, I always was sort of like considering other people's perspectives and my own, and so you know, it's not good to be a quarterback and, and ask everybody around you, what are you thinking about? What, what, are, you, what are your thoughts about what the next play should be? You know, it's sort of not exactly the way you, you know, it, was, it was sort of like, um, it was, um, and so I, um, separating from my mom was um, a bit of a challenge, but not more than normal. Uh, she wanted, she and my father wanted me to stay home at, at college and I compromised by going to a college that was nearby that was not the type of college that I really wanted to go to. And, um, and so it was a, um, but that was my, you know, way of saying I, le I need at least this much separation. And, um, and I did negotiate not to have to live at home uh, during the college years and in retrospect I'm extremely glad I didn't because I saw the people at at my uh, university, that where I went to as an undergraduate, I saw the people who did stay at home become very unable to separate from their parents. And so it was a very, it was like the maturity level between the people that were on campus and the people who commuted were, was enormous and, and, and uh, visceral and um, visible um, by the third year. And so, um, and, then, and then from that point on, um, I shortly after that got married, um, after I graduated from, um, I, did, I went to UCLA for my master's degree and that was across the country. I was on the East Coast where I grew up in New Jersey. And then, uh, then I went to uh, the West Coast and realized that the West Coast was far more uh, palatable for me than the East Coast was. And um, it was more, uh, more liberal, more exploratory, more innovative and so on than the East Coast was more traditional of the United States. And, but my, my, my wife, my former wife, um, got a job with IBM um, as a, um, um, and so, and that was out of New York, and so we moved back to New York, and which was good because I stayed connected with my family, but because I was married, um, I was able to be reasonably disconnected, and then when I was 23, my mother committed suicide, and so that was, um, and, and because I wasn't really super close to my mother, I didn't think that that would impact me, but I was amazed at the degree to which it impacted me. And, um, and very much um, saddened me and you know and I felt that um, you know I would have liked to have been able to um, you know part of my interest in feminism was that my mother had said to me that she had you know she had gone through college uh, she, she had gotten a scholarship to Cornell and had decided not to go through college so that she could buy clothes and have things to attract a man and um, and I always felt that's so sad what a sad decision and she felt it was a sad decision and the wrong decision. And so um, that was very, um, you know, and that made me re very responsive to the feminist movement saying, you know, that women should not just be um, attached to and dependent upon men, they should have their own lives. Because I saw her sacrifice her life in that way um, and ultimately sacrifice her life uh, in, a, in a, a literal way. I think for me, when I go into my darkest places, it's sort of um, when I feel that um, sometimes if my wife and I are, uh, my wife is much more traditional than I am, and so I'm more, she's more born again Christian type uh, background, not really born again Christian now, but Christian in her orientation nevertheless. And I'm much more Buddhist in my orientation, even though I'm not a Buddhist per se. And so sometimes those, the gap between us can make me feel that even though we get along extremely well, 
that the essence of me is not the essence of her. That we sort of, um, and so, um, while I feel loved at one level, I don't feel understood at that very deepest level of the things that really motivate me because they're not her motivations. And so, um, and so that can make me feel like loved but unloved. And, um, and so that combines with, you know, feeling like the things I write are things that almost nobody gets. My father, you know, before he died said, you know, I worry that you, you know, that maybe you really don't love women or like women. And I, you know, that's just so completely the opposite of the truth inside of me. But the fact that, you know, that when, when you write the things that say, you know, we need to pay attention to men, then some people can feel, interpret that as that, therefore you must not like women. Um, even though it's clear that in my writing that I do. But nevertheless, that leaves me feeling not understood by my father. And uh, my mother committed suicide, so I don't have the mother there to, to sort of say, I, I see it very differently than that. And so the people who are my friends, um, you know, um, for many years, they um, they don't see it. Um, you know, they they don't really get who I am. And so very often I feel like nobody loves me, nobody needs me. There's no hope of that changing. And when in those moments um, I can get really down and feeling like, what have I spent my whole life doing? I don't have. I really I I love um, children and young people and. Um, but but um, and, it's, um, and yet I have not had a chance to have a son or a daughter myself. I have a stepdaughters, two stepdaughters, but not they're not my biological children. So I always had a it was always my 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 wife's um, say that really um, I, that I was an advisor. I wasn't an equal, and so I always had a hierarchical relationship with my wife, with she being the boss in relation to the children. And so that's, um, and I know that when I'm around kids, and I was a counselor for many years and stuff like that, that the best of me comes out, and I just totally am in joy about that. And so it feels like, you know, one part of me, uh, one part of my purpose, uh, the essence of me, that, you know, if, if there's a God, what God created me for, which was to connect with kids, and um, was, um, has been missed. And so that can make me feel very down. And so, um, but in the bigger picture, the way I get through it is realizing that, you know, that as I, as I hear other men speak about their lives, I hear that everybody has their trade-offs. Everybody has things that, that really <laughs> make them filled with joy and other things that really sadden them. And you can't do it all, <laughs> you know. And I said, I really remind myself, yes, you know, here on one level you've had the, this, you know, the 99% the, the of men that you know are doing things that, that are compromises in their life and in order to be able to bring up their children more effectively. And because you didn't have children to bring up, you were able to not to say things without compromising. You didn't have to worry about bringing an income to support your wife and to support your children. And as a result of that, you could be as honest as you could possibly figure out how to be. And um, and so, and I say that that way as opposed to saying I could tell the truth because I think the moment I or anybody says I, I was able to tell the truth, uh, that's a lie. Uh, that there is no truth. That there is only your best version of trying to get toward the truth. And so, but the fact that I was able to explore like that and put that out there and be so honest with my work. Um, that really gives me great joy and so reminding myself that no one has everything and that um, I have some I have chosen a path that has has that has g given me certain enormous blessings but also chosen a path that has um, that has not allowed me to have some of the joys that I would have had if I hadn't chosen that path I think I, if I were 97 and I were sitting next to my 14-year-old grandson or uh, young man, um, I think the first thing that I would do is to say to him, um, would, you, um, would you be good enough to help me? Um, I need, um, I'd like to write a, a book about, um, to, as a, as a person who is my age, speaking to a 14-year-old. Um, but I'm not a 14-year-old boy anymore. So I need your help in helping me sort of discover what communicates with a 14-year-old boy. 
And I'm saying this to him because I know that that uh, anybody listens a lot better when they're part of the process that creates what is happening. Um, and also that I will learn more by listening to him and <laughs> doing this as well. So it's a, a dual benefit process. And so th- th- then I would ask and I would say, let me share some things with you and, and that, that I think were relevant for me and ask you how they, what, what they, do they make sense or not make sense or what makes sense about them or what doesn't make sense about them uh, for your life. And I guess one of the first things that I would say is um, that it's more important than anything else to, to listen to people. Uh, that um, almost everybody wants to talk and be heard, and so if you're um, and if you're and letting people know what you heard them say is so um, helpful for people feeling loved by you. And if you do, um, and if you do that, um, you don't need to make a lot of money. You don't need to be the king of um, whatever profession you're in. That people's need to be heard and um, and to be seen. Um, is so enormous that when you do that for them, they will seek you. They will seek connection to you, and you will um, have you will develop in yourself a type of gentleness and wisdom uh, that will be um, that will be very um, that will serve you very well, um, and it will serve the, uh, the your relationships. Whether you're straight or gay, you'll, you know your partner will feel um, connected to you and loved by you and. Um, and so I, I'd say, and so then I would ask him, you know, is there anybody in your life that you've listened to? Do you have anybody in your life that you would listen to any differently if you were to take this advice? Is this advice that you think is stupid or, you know, is it helpful? And um, ask him to elaborate on that. Um, the other thing that I would say is to um, put family first, um, you know, that, that I'm your grandpa or I'm, you know, an, um, somebody who um, loves you or cares for you, and that um, that in the final analysis, um, that I remember my mom one day um, saying to me um, that you know there's a new kid that was moving in on the street, and so um, you know go up and introduce yourself to him and make him feel comfortable, and in, in the neighborhood. So I did, and so and we had a great time, the new kid and myself. And so I came back to um, my mother and she said, you know, how'd that go? And I said, fantastic. And she said, oh, wow, that's a really, you know, strong answer, but that's wonderful. Um, and, you know, well, what made it fantastic? Well, he said, I've just, had, you know, I've met my, my best friend. And she said, your best friend? And, you know, a bit more so than your family? And I said, yeah, yeah, more so than my family. And she said, oh, that's kind of sad. And I said, well, why is that sad? Um, and she said, because the chances are fairly good 10 years from now, you won't even remember this boy's name, um, but we'll be here for you. And that, that over the course of your lifetime, you'll see that family is much more important than you ever gave it credit for. Yes, we may not understand you in some aspects of the same way that this kid and you get along because you're the same age and so on, but the people who are your family, they're going to be there for you for, for life um, if, if you help make that the case. And so I've always seen, the older I've gotten, the more I realize how right she is. And so, um, and so uh, I would say put, you know, uh, make sure that the most in- important decision that you ever make is the choice of your partner. And uh, the choice of your partner will be, uh, will determine um, how well you get along with that person, and how at peace with yourself you feel how um, much you are growing together. You won't go to bed at night lonely or feeling alienated or feeling like you were um, married on the outside and divorced on the inside or psychologically divorced. Um, and that, you know, that you, that the choice of your partner determines the children that you create together. It determines a lot about what type of career you can go into because you don't want to alienate your partner by going into a career that alienates her. Um, and if assuming you're heterosexual, you know that a happy, um, you know, life is a happy wife, um, and um, that it's more important that she's happy than it is that 
you're happy at the outset because when she's happy you'll be happy <laughs> um, because that's the way it just that's the way it is <laughs> um, and the um, and it's not that it's not important that you're happy it is very important that you're happy and happiness is the most important thing um, for you but her being happy taking care of that first is so significant in what will make you happy uh, on the other hand don't um, be afraid to say what makes you happy to her. Um, if she wants you to be make more money and that feels like it's not allowing you to do what you really want to do and fulfills you, you need to confront that and be honest about that. If you're raising your children and you um, and you want to sort of do something separate for, but with your children and not share that with her, um, no, have the guts to share it with her and have the guts to talk it through with her even if she disagrees with you and so um, um, keep connected at every level don't divorce her on one level or divorce your kids on another level introduce your kids to um, to realities um, even when they are um, even when they're hard to hear at first um, the um, don't look for what pleases look for what is will serve people and your family better in the long run. Uh, so I would talk to him a great deal as if he were a parent himself, because through that parenting eyes, I think people are able to hear better what they need to learn for themselves, because you, um, you're sort of asking him to think of himself as responsible and as mature. And so you're creating through that type of discussion with that type of tone and um, directive, you're creating a little rite of passage in the mind um, um, by asking him to consider himself in those responsible positions. Um, I would say um, you know, never you know that there are a few things that are that are game changers in life. Uh, one is doing things where you're physically risking your life, and um, like you know. Um, downhill skiing at a, a slope that's too advanced or you know sort of playing um, you know car racing or racing in a car uh, where you're risking your life or driving while you're drunk or having sex un that's unprotected when you're not at all when you're not sure whether the woman or yourself is on birth control and those things in one instant um, of drunk driving or one instant of not of looking at a beautiful woman on the sidewalk and not looking at what's happening in front of you um, or one instance of um, of um, having sex with somebody that that you're that you really are attracted to, but that you wouldn't spend your life with. Um, you know, 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 my young man, that every time you put your penis in a woman's body, you put your life in her hands. And so think about that before you put your penis in her body, especially if it's unprotected, um, because that you know is, is this a person you want to spend your life with and um, and or that have a huge amount of your life um, concerned with and so um, I would ask him to sort of ever to monitor himself so that every time that he's trying to say something or doing something so because he will look better he believes he'll look better doing that or saying that that um, to to know that um, that he's selling himself um, out, um, that he's not being true to himself, and that there's no greater source of happiness than constantly working toward being true to yourself. And then I would ask him to ask me questions and tell me what he feels uh, about his life and what types of, uh, that if he were talking to a seven-year-old, what would he be saying uh, to the seven-year-old? And so I bring out from him his wisdom. If I put my penis in a woman's body um, that I've regretted? Yeah, and the answer to that is mostly no. But that means, have I done that? You know, so, um, you know, the good news is that I've never been drunk in my life. I've never been, had sex with a woman who is drunk. Um, and so on that level, but there are women who... Um, if I asked a different question, which is, um, if she had become pregnant and wanted to have a child, would I have wanted to have a connection with her my entire life? And the answer to that question would be no. 
um, you know, that I was very happy for the evening we spent together, or the evenings we spent together, but I, this, was, this was not my life partner. And so I was sometimes um, not cautious enough in that regard, um, and at the same time, um, I'm glad I wasn't so cautious that I prevented myself from having, um, you know, the relationships I did because I certainly, um, I th you know, almost no woman that I've been with that I haven't in some way learned from or grown from. So it's a, it's a balancing act. The most important thing as a guy to understand is that when you ask people for help, when, whenever, you, whenever I've had a problem and I've sort of been, there's been a part of me that's wanted to solve that problem on my own, that hasn't wanted to ask for help from others, um, but because I didn't want them to think less of me. And when I got off of that, off of that train and said to me, and, and asked for help, I have almost always been amazed at two things. The number of resources that are out there uh, to be able to help me answer the questions. Um, the number of people who feel honored by my asking them and so therefore that I've really given something to their life as I've allowed them to give something to me. Um, and those have been, um, and that that it's so much easier in my life to, I remember a story once, um, uh, hearing a story of, of somebody who um, uh, had a, had a, a cart um, and a, uh, a, a cart stuck in, a, in mud in a little village, a rural, rural village, and he got the strongest man in the community to, to, to try to push the cart out, but the cart was so deeply um, embodied in the mud that he, the, even the strongest man in the community couldn't do that. And a relatively weak man in the community walked by and he said, um, you know, I could get that cart out of the mud for you. And everybody sort of laughed at him. And, um, and the guy said, um, he gathered together about 30 men in the community. And the 30 men together um, got the cart out of the mud. And that there is always those 30 men available to you. You're always much stronger when you when you work with others. And and working with others always requires starting um, by asking for help. And so that when you evaluate what you can do in life, um, just evaluate it based on not what you alone can do, but you with others can do.